Hello everyone and welcome to module number five. Uh, this week our focus is going to be on neurology um, and dealing with the neurological system. So with that we are looking at three chapters. We are looking at chapter 25 pages 565 to 576 chapter 37, pages 850 to 853, and then chapter 41, pages 938 through 947. So let's go ahead and jump on in and let's get started here. For chapter 25, this is really focused on neurology. And neurology is the study of the nervous system. Now, before you can really understand your role as a medical assistant in this unit, you really need to understand the system, its functions, and the structure of the system that we are working with. So the nervous system is a vital component of the human body. It is responsible for transmitting and transferring information through electrical impulses that move along and travel along our cells. The nervous system has three main functions, and those functions are to detect and interpret sensory information, take information that it has received, and make a decision about how it should be received, and then it finishes it by carrying out a mother, another function based upon the decision that were made. So now that we know its functions, let's talk about some of the specialized structured cells that are within our nervous system. So we have three main types of neurons in our body. Uh, those neurons are specialized nerve cells. They are motor neurons, sensory neurons, and interneurons. Now motor neurons control most of the body's functions. They cause a muscle to contract, glands to secrete, and organs to function. This type of neuron is called an efferent neuron, which means that they can transmit an impulse away from the body cell and go to the central nervous system to stimulate a muscle, organ, or a gland. Sensory neurons are attached to sensory receptors in your body, uh, typically those of like your fingertips, your toes, your um, eyes, your ears, your nose, things that you have like the five senses that go to. They transmit sensory information from those receptors to the central nervous system through the peripheral projection. Now sensory neurons lack a true dendrite. They are sheathed but they're more closely to that that resemble axions than actual neurons. And the final one we have is called an intraneuron. Now these are called associative neurons. They are located completely within the central nervous system and they kind of act as a liaison or kind of like a go-between for the sensory neurons and the motor neurons. So they're kind of just the middleman is the best way to think about them. So now that you understand the functions of the nervous system and the structure of the nervous system, it's important that you know that your nervous system is made up of two separate um, systems. It's your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is composed only of the brain and the spinal cord. This is the system that will receive impulses from the entire body process the information that it receives, and send out a appropriate action. And when we're looking at these, these are some of the um, nerves and functions of those nerves uh, within the central nervous system. Then we have a little bit more about your central nervous system here, so your spinal cord. Uh, is obviously the cord that extends from the base of your medulla oblongata into your vertical lumbar vertebrae. So 
So what happens in your spinal cord is it kind of gets all these sensory impulses from the rest of your body. So kind of all of those come directly to your spinal cord. It shoots it up to the brain and it sends out this motor neuron impulse. And then it can also act as your reflux center for your impulses for your nerves. Now your peripheral nervous system is composed of cranial and spinal nerves that connect to your central nervous system and it acts as other parts of the body. Now your peripheral nervous system is further broken down into two other systems. It's called the somatic and the automatic nervous system. Your somatic nervous system is made up of nerves that connect to skeletal muscles, sensory organs, and the skin. These are all the voluntary ones. So when you and your head say, oh, I need to take a step and your foot actually moves, you, that's your body telling you to move a voluntary thing. You have control over moving those things. Um, whereas your automatic nervous system is your involuntary uh, system. It handles things that you cannot control. Things such as sweating, um, maybe telling a, gra a gland to secrete, your heart to pump, your stomach to push muscles through, or to push food through and contract and relax. So all the things that your body does that we have no control over, that is part of your automatic nervous system. Now, as that wasn't confusing enough, your automatic nervous system then further breaks down into two other systems called your sympathetic and your parasympathetic. So the easiest way to kind of think about these is one of them, and I'm not going to tell you which one, I want you to do a little bit of the research, uh, deals with your fight or flight. So when you get those emotions or you get those feelings of fear or that your body says it's time to move, it's time to go because something is something bad is about to happen, that's one of your, your automatic nervous systems because your body automatically does it without you telling it to do it. Where the other one is kind of like the, the stay and chill kind of one. All right, so that's going to wrap up uh, this chapter for us. So let's move forward into chapter 37, which is talking about assisting in neurology. So this chapter will help to explain what the medical assistant's role is in neurology. Now, neurology is the study of the nervous system. And you'll work with physicians such as a neurologist, who is a physician that specializes in treating and diagnosing conditions of the nervous system. You'll possibly work with a neurosurgeon, who is the one that performs any surgical procedures within the neurology field. You could also work with a psychiatrist, which is a physician who treats mental and neurological conditions, such as affective behavior disorders. Now, as a clinical medical assistant, you will have the duties of rooming your patients, reviewing their histories, and completing maybe new forms. You might be able to schedule appropriate tests or procedures. You're going to pair, prepare the exam room for any sort of um, procedures that the provider will do or exams that they'll do. And the types of exams that are done by providers in this field test their state of consciousness, their reflex responses, their motor responses, any speech pattern or behavior pattern abnormalities. And you can ensure that all the necessary supplies are ready for the provider. You can support and encourage your patient and even position them if needed. And the other thing that you'll be responsible for is providing any sort of patient education on treatment plans or tests that they're about to have. All right, so that's the short part of chapter 37. We're going to move to our final chapter, which is chapter 41, which talks about and discusses geriatric patients. And it's important that when you're working with the elderly, you have to keep in mind that they'll have different changes than everyone else. They'll have some physical changes. They'll have some mental changes 
some confusion. Um, they could have depression. And this is just the short list. So their physical changes could just be things that are kind of outside of their body. Um, but it could also be things that happen internally that we can't see. Generally, a lot of different factors will um, influence how a physical change happens. Uh, things such as maybe their nutritional choices, um, their physical and social environments that they've been in, maybe um, some occupational hazards that they've been aware of. With their mental changes, we have to think about deterioration, and that's typically not a part of normal aging. But it does, however, increase with the risk of various physical disorders. Whenever you're working with an elderly person or any person who has any mental health or mental changes, always remember to, to encourage them to remain active and engage in social interactions. That really helps with those two pieces. I think that most of you can understand what confusion is um, and also what depression is. So we're also going to talk about how um, they can have some of these common disorders, uh, things such as Alzheimer's or Bell palsy. They can have things such as headaches. This is actually the number one thing that neurologists will deal with is people who have headaches and different types of headaches. No one headache is the same. You'll deal with people who have neuralgia or Parkinson's. Uh, neuralgia is really just a term that we use for, for nerve pain when we can't figure out what is causing the pain. Okay. Another thing that we could be dealing with is dementia. I don't have it up here, um, but it is something that happens to be a part of the neurological system is dealing with dementia and Alzheimer's. So with that, I'm going to kind of lead into what your homework is for the week, and I feel like that was actually a really good lead-in because your discussion board this week is you are actually looking at dementia and Alzheimer's, those two diseases. And what you're going to do is you're going to do some research, and you're going to, you're going to really look into this, and you're going to discuss whether you believe that Alzheimer's and dementia are two diseases that are the same, with different names, or are they actually two different diseases? So that's a really important topic to talk about. Are they the same or are they different? And you really need to give some good feedback and some good reasons as to why you feel the way that you do. So if you think that they are two diseases with kind of interchangeable names, tell us why. If you think that they are two different diseases, tell us why. Okay, we want to know, I want to know, and I, I'm sure your classmates will want to know because everyone's opinion may be a little bit different. So make sure that you are uh, meeting the criteria, first and foremost, meeting the questions of the discussion board, and make sure that you're reading through the rubric that I've posted in your module so that way you can have a better understanding of what exactly I'm looking for in a discussion post. And hopefully by week five, you've started to really gain the knowledge of what I'm looking for. Your initial, depo <laughs> Woo, try that again. Your initial discussion post will be due um, Tuesday, October 31st by midnight. Now, I understand that's Halloween, um, but try to get it done earlier in the day so that way you can go out and enjoy Halloween with your children if you partake in that. You'll need to reply to at least one classmate no later than Saturday, November 4th by midnight. Please remember, reply post to me as the, the instructor. Do not count for your grade. It has to be to a classmate. And it has to be something more than just I agree, I disagree. You have to actually put in good feedback to them. You'll have one quiz this week and that quiz is over the chapters listed here in everything dealing with neurology. Uh, typically I'm going to tell you to wait until after you go through your lab class or classes um, so you get the best knowledge. Okay, That is a 10 multiple choice question quiz. You do have a 10 minute time limit. And that's all I've got for you for week number five. So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please reach out to me either via email or through the course messaging in Blackboard. Have a wonderful week, guys, and happy Halloween. Bye now.